Right. Well, hello again and welcome to Tuesday Chats and I'm delighted uh, to have uh, Anton Scheel uh, with us. We'll go over to Carlo uh, to say hello to Anton. Hello, uh, hello, Anton. Hiya, Stephen. How are you? Yeah, good. Good, good to see you. Uh, and I'm delighted that you've... Uh, um, just to find out about you and your life and uh, some of the things that really motivate you. Um, so maybe tell us, Anton, uh, your, where you're from. And uh, so you're not originally from Ireland. Uh, maybe do you want to tell us your sort of home setting? No, I, originally I'm from Holland. I, I came from uh, Zealand, that's below Rotterdam. They're islands where... Um, small groups of people live and that's where i'm from so uh, i came to ireland in 1984 and uh, i started working on a farm in kildare that's that's okay. how i came here and then uh, after a while I, I ended up on my own farm in clonmore so that's okay. where I, and and, and w w what prompted you to leave uh, to, to what, what prompted you to come to ireland uh, Holland is very organized. Some people love it. Some people really love it. Mm. Personally, I prefer a bit of freedom. And I think mm. there's freedom in chaos <laughs> in, a, in a funny sort of a way. And at, I, I'm from a farming background. And at the time, and I, I think it's even worse now, uh, you could have bought a house in Holland for the price of a whole farm in Ireland. And sheep farming is low is uh, low cost farming. Mm. So you can't do that on very expensive land. And uh, yeah, I, I like the greenness. I like the, mm. the, you know, one of the great things I think about Ireland is, is the usher will make it work. And I think that attitude is something that I really enjoy. Right, right, right. Okay. <laughs> That's a, a good point. Um, and, and I suppose just when you, it strikes me about land. So you, am I right in thinking you came from a very flat area to then sort of more hilly ground or whatever? Yeah, yeah it's very hilly. We're on the foothills of Wicklow here, so we're, yeah, it's yeah. it's very hilly. And but it's it's nice. It's there's a there's a good energy about it. It it feels good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super. Um, and. And so is, is it basically sheep farming that you know any other elements of farming? It's, it's mainly sheep farming. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So okay. in 19, no, in 2005, I ended up with um, a sort of a, a whole heap of things that happened to me. And as a result of it, I ended up with something like fibromyalgia. And that made farming very hard for me. So I had to find another way of making ends meet. And yeah, so I retired from farming and that in a way gave me time to do all sorts of things that people normally don't be doing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Super. Great. Um, uh, and so you are connected with uh, uh, Carlo Mathis Church, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Super. Um, and it, it, of some of the uh, things that you have found yourself uh, in, what, what sort of, whether it be the, the church or just generally in life, what do you want to name any one of your sort of passions and what gets you uh, excited? Uh, I, I love youth work. Youth mm -hmm. work is something that I, 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 and youth work in a, from a point of view of an educational point, I, I think with youth work, you can do education in a way that school can't do. You're, it, it's about bringing, mm -hmm. bringing out the best of people and giving them happy memories and giving them things that they can build on. You, I believe that everyone needs good memories. Everyone needs to be able to look back and say, there was someone that actually cared about me. 
there was someone that put in effort. There, there was an opportunity I had to do whatever I wanted to do, to grow or to express myself or things like that. And I think to create opportunities for young people will help them in later life. Yeah, yeah. That, that yeah. would be that would be one of my biggest passions. It's mm -hmm. uh, I really enjoy that. And and strangely through all sorts of things happening together, when I my wife and I got involved with the school for deaf children in Lebanon and the same educational things that apply here apply there and it's great to be part of helping young people build good memories yeah. and brilliant. give them opportunities brilliant yeah fantastic um and um you, you, you touched on, on on the school for deaf children now as i understand it this arises maybe from your family background do, do you want to before you go on to say about this connection with the School for Deaf Children, do you want to say where, where your heart in, in, in this regard comes from, I think, from your own family? Uh, both my parents were born deaf. Mm. So I grew up in a house where there were two deaf people. and But my three brothers and me, we thought it was normal, as you, as you would. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Other people didn't think it was normal. Mm. And the amount of times that we would have been asked, who taught you to speak? My parents taught us to speak. Yeah. They did. <laughs> and now when you're small, you don't even think about that. It just happens. But yeah. my parents both were able to speak. They were able to lip read. My mother is amazing in a lot of aspects, but she speaks Dutch and English yeah. while being deaf. And uh, right. yeah, so that's, that's where we would have grown up. And um, I think being that having parents who are deaf, there is good and bad sides to it. One of the, in a way, because you can do what they can't do, you are asked to do things for them. That might not be a good thing, but it's it's life. Yeah. My parents couldn't ring anyone, so we had to make phone calls for them. Okay. And sometimes that is not a good thing because the the, the relationship is not the you know parents are supposed to be the adults and right. kids are supposed to be the kids yeah and when kids become the translators between adults that's not always good mm -hmm. the other side of it is you do you're taught responsibility very early on in life mm. and that's a good thing I think and when you grow up in situations where things may be a little bit difficult, you also get to appreciate that people need a leg up. Mm. People need help. And you, and you also get to see how cruel people can be to other people. Okay, yeah. Probably, often the times they don't do it on purpose, but it does happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, would you say that in regard to various levels of, of abilities, w whether it be deafness or, uh, or, or other uh, 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 conditions or disabilities or impairments that the people might have? Uh, has that given you a heart for just looking out for the needs of, of others? Yeah, I, yeah, it does. It, uh... Uh, Reverend Sark touched on it at his um, centenary sermon, something that would be very close to my heart is he made the point that uh, if we start treating people as things, mm. there's a problem. Yeah. yeah. And that happens when we somehow think that we are a little bit more special than someone else. Mm. Yeah. And then things go wrong. Definitely. Um, and it, it just maybe I didn't ask too much about your, your in terms of your, your parents and um, it, uh, is your anything about your, your development and growth in faith and your, uh, were you from a, a church context in in Netherlands or um, yeah, just hang on a second I just close the door here back.
Yeah, at uh, I think I what I've seen with my parents, it's if you have a handicap or something that other people don't have, if you something that holds you back, that's difficult. It's very difficult because it's something that you can't change. If you are fortunate enough or blessed enough to believe that there is someone on your side, that helps. Mm. If you don't have that, it's going to, it's a very, very lonely life. Okay. So I, I think, yeah, I think faith is probably when you, when life is a bit tougher, mm. faith is even more important mm. than I think faith is probably always important. It's always good to have that feeling that there is someone greater than you on your side. Mm. Mm. But I think especially when things are tough, that makes the difference. That's what allows you to get up in the morning. It allows you to keep going. Because life is hard. Yeah, 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 yeah. S super, yeah. Um, well, maybe kind of then uh, you, you, you go back then to your reference to the uh, Institute for, for the Deaf um, in Lebanon. Do you want to tell us about that? Uh, I suppose I should say for Methodists, when we, in our praying each month and in uh, other material from World Development and Relief, we've heard about the Father Andevig Institute for the Deaf, I hope I've said that right, in Lebanon. So uh, maybe just do you want to tell us more about that? Uh, well, my uncle started it in 1957, mm. what well, is a long, long time ago. And it's actually a lovely story. He was a he was a student of theology and he took a year out. Now he, he would have known about deafness and he would have been involved in youth work with young people and all that, with deaf young people. But when he arrived in Beirut, he, when, the, when the boat docked the harbor, he could see all these men going up and down the, the planks, picking up stuff and carrying it back down. And they were kicked and they were shoved. And these men, showed no emotion mm. and they were beaten and they were shot up and down and he was trying to figure out what is going on here mm. and he was nosy and he was curious so he went over and he discovered that all these guys were deaf mm. and the idea was if someone can't speak then they probably don't have any pain either so you can do what you want with them so he was appalled by that idea and he started a little coffee shop in the harbor and he started to become their advocates and he started to negotiate pay agreements for them and he started to do all sorts of things. And, and like all things in life, bullies only operate well when no one stands up to them. Mm. And when someone stands up to them, they don't know what to do. Yes. So he was actually able to make a big change. And then one day, Someone knocked on the door of his apartment and he opened the door and here were two little kids and an adult and the adult said to him, you're the guy who loves the deaf people. And he said, yeah, he said, there you go. So he got a present of two children. And that became contagious. And after a while, he had a good few children. Wow. And then after a while, he got someone to help him and he got an, aid, an NGO to fund a school building. And that's how the Father on the West School started many, many years ago. And in 2008, my wife and I went over. My uncle died in 1999. And in 2008, we went over and we sort of got involved. And yeah, it's sort of still there. Brilliant, brilliant. Fantastic. Wow. Um, and 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 what do so? What essentially does the institute do now? And what do you do when you you go over there? The, I, my uncle's ethos is still very much alive. That the purpose of the school is to make life better for people who have a hearing impairment. Yeah. In whatever sign or in whatever way that that might be. Mm -hmm. So uh, and. What that means now is that they have a lot of refugees who have no opportunity anywhere. Mm, yeah. They have, I think, I think what most kids have in common there is that they're all poor. 
They come from all sorts of religions, but they're all poor. Yeah. And there's a common bond there then. Mm-hmm. And there's a common ba- bond between the parents because they all have a child that is not the way they would have liked it to be. Yeah, yeah. And I think the yeah, the main deaf education starts with helping parents to accept and to build relationship with their children that are not the way they would expect them to be. Mm-hmm. And that's difficult. And that's yeah. very traumatic. And there is a grieving process there. And it's, it's, and it, if you did nothing else, if you managed that bit, mm-hmm. you will have made a huge difference both to the parents, yeah. to the deaf child and to the siblings. Mm-hmm. You will have done an awful, I, I'm a firm believer that if we can get our head right, the other stuff will happen. <laughs> but the main yeah. thing is we have to have our head right. Yeah, then yeah. we can avail of opportunities that come our way. That that's when we can that's yeah. when we can do lots of things. Yeah. 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 But, uh, and from a faith point of view, what, what, what my uncle and it's a great story of my uncle Andy. He, he became an Anglican priest and he uh and his the, the school, the playground on a Sunday used to be packed. There used to be 150 or 200 people there every Sunday. Hmm. And uh, in England, the, the Missionary Society, they were amazed by this. They thought this was this was brilliant. Hmm. So, you know, to have a missionary out there and he's growing his population. So these two people went from the Missionary Society over there to find out what was the secret? What was he doing? Hmm. So they brought a the translator with them and they were going around the playground and they asked the first person, you know, how did you come to faith? And the guy looked at him and he said, what do you mean I can't? I, I'm a Muslim. Yeah, but why are you here? Because of him. So they kept asking and they couldn't figure out what was wrong. And then they asked one person, but they said, how come you arrive here to a Christian church service every Sunday where someone is preaching behind the cross? Hmm. have you no intention of becoming a Christian why are you here and they all said we like his God Hmm. Hmm. and I think that's what it was all about it was Uncle Andy preached that there was a God out there that cared for everyone regardless who you are or what you are Yeah. and he was actually able to go over Hmm obstacles that, that, that we perceive and that we see and powerful yeah and, and i think to me that's what faith is all about yeah 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 powerful. actually jump over the fences mm-hmm. yeah thank you yeah um can, can i move on to ask you about uh, some of the other things you're involved with mm-hmm. uh, do you want to tell us about the food bank pantry in 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 carlo and it sounds like that there's, you're hitting a, a real need and that's really the need. Yeah, it's it's an interesting project. It's, yeah. it's going a good few years now. It's different to most food banks. Mm. And what makes it different is we, I, I, as, as I said earlier, I'm, I grew up as a farmer. Mm. And the thing about farming normally is that you know how many animals you're going to have for the winter. Mm. You know how much feeding you need for the winter. So you plan. With the food bank, we have no idea how many people are going to come. Yeah. And we have no idea how much food we're going to have. But somehow it's working. Yeah. But for a farmer, it's actually a very difficult thing to, to get your head around. But it is working. How we operate it is we have what we call key people, our partners. They're doctors, social workers the Carlo Women's Aid, Bernardo's, uh, the Rape Crisis Center, all sorts of different people from different areas. And when they see a need somewhere, they will come to us and they will ask, can you give us a food parcel? Because I want to give it to a family. Mm-hmm. They will ask the family for permission if it's okay to give the parcel. So what it means is that there's a lot, a, a big group of people are doing work that they're not getting paid for, that they don't have to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A GP doesn't have to get in his car and drive over to the food pantry to collect the food parcel and bring it back to a patient. 
that's not part of his job description. Yeah. So the fact that he or she is willing to do that mm-hmm. means that he or she believes there is a need. Yeah, yeah. And what they're also telling that person that they're giving it to, you are valuable enough for me to get in my car and go and get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think that, part, I believe that's just as valuable as the parcel. Yeah. So, so last year we handed out over 1,100 food parcels. Mm. And it's, we estimate there's the value is between 65 and 70 euros. Mm. What means that what we handed out in food last year wasn't far off the total running cost of car local Kenny circuit. Yeah. <laughs> but, it's, wow. but it's amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it, 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 it's God at work at its best. Mm. You have 20 or 30 people sitting in the church on a Sunday overseeing mm. something that is that big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, um, that is amazing. Yeah. Well, God is at work where, 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 where the need, where, where there's need, where there's human need. Um, and uh, I mean, do you think this is, uh, do, do you see any trends in, in this uh, that people, people's lives and circumstances are getting tougher uh, uh, in terms of the, the need for, uh, for food I, or for... I, I think uh, there are more I don't, I don't, I don't know how many, but I believe that this functionality in families mm. is quite big. Mm. Mm. What percentage? I don't know, but I, yeah. I think, um, and if you go to Lebanon, if you go to a refugee camp, you have stark poverty. Yeah, yeah. That is an actual lack of whatever. In Ireland, a lot of the problems come through problems that are caused by some form of dysfunctionality, whatever that may be. Mm -hmm. It's a different problem. It's just as big a problem. It's just different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that, yeah, I I mean, the the media tells us that domestic violence has been on the increase through COVID and other forms of dysfunctionality are on the increase. Mm. And I think, yeah, food parcels become part of that. Mm. I think where a food parcel can be extremely helpful is if someone has a lot of problems by giving them a food parcel for three or four days, that might free them up to focus on the other problems. Yeah, yeah. Whatever they may be. Yeah, 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 totally, totally. So, yeah. Um, Thank you. And and so this links in maybe or possibly with you, you're chairperson of Carlo Women's Aid. Is, is That's that right, it? yeah. Uh, do you want to say about that? How, how did you get involved in that? And maybe, should I even ask why is a man the chairperson of uh, the, the Women's Aid? I, well, I asked you, that question did, myself. Yeah, <laughs> how did you get involved? Um, but Carlo Women's Aids were collecting food parcels in the food pantry. Hmm. And that's how our relationship built. And then Tusla, the, there was a funding issue with Tusla and they were short of board members and whatever. And sort of through no fault of my own, I was roped in and I became chairperson and I'm still there four years later. And so, but it was on the agenda that Carlo Women's Aid was going to be closed mm. and it's still open. Mm. It's bigger and it's functioning better than I think it has ever done before. It's, mm-hmm. it's trying to do the best they can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, you've mentioned you know, the dysfunctionality of, of families and, and do you want to say anything more about the, the need of women's aid specifically or? I, I think sometimes, I, I, sometimes relationships go bad. Mm not because they're bad people, but it's because for whatever reason, people don't seem to be able to reach into the skills they need Mm. to deal with conflict. Mm. And that escalates and that escalates and that escalates. And then they don't know, then they can't find a way back. Yeah. That could be a reason. There could be many reasons for 
dysfunctional relationship. I think domestic violence is not a cause, it's an effect of dysfunctional relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think the percentage of dysfunctional relationships is actually on the increase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, thank you. Th thank you for sharing these things, Anton. Uh, can I just uh, maybe as we come to a close, ask you about your own uh, when you mention relationships, you, you, you have a, a family of children, grandchildren. We have six grandchildren. Yeah. Three married children and yeah. Geraldine, I'm married to Geraldine. So we're, yeah, okay. very yeah. proud of the, the whole family. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Well, listen, I really uh, appreciate uh, you taking this time to just share your heart with us. Uh, anything, actually, I should just check in with you that, uh, if there was anything else you wanted to cover that we didn't uh, cover here uh, at all. I don't know. I, I think one thing that's helped me over the years, and I, and I, I this is my preachery bit, mm. what helped me over the years has always been that if you can identify something to, that you've done during the day that might be of some help to someone, mm. that is good for your own mental health. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that is something that we should strive to identify every evening. Mm. something that might have been of some use to someone that day yeah 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 powerful uh, i think that, that that that's a great note to to finish on but listen anton thank you very much for for sharing with us uh today thank we you. really really appreciate it thank you